Um, so first of all, I want to uh, introduce you to uh, our first speaker for today, uh, Jorge Lanza from, uh, from the, the CEO of Exolum. Exolum is, is uh, as I'm sure he'll tell you, is, is a new brand name uh, for CLH. And um, just a little bit about, about Jorge. Uh, he's the CEO of the Exolum Group, based in Madrid. Uh, and uh, he graduated as an industrial engineer from the, from uh, Madrid University and has an MSc in engineering from Stanford University. He has a deep knowledge of the oil and energy industry that he's had over 22 years in the, uh, in, in the petroleum business value train, including refining, trading, supply and sales and marketing. He joined CLH in February 2016 after an extensive career in BP. In BP, he uh, he was he's been a refinery manager. He was, he finished he's, he finished BP as executive president of BP Spain and Portugal, uh, and but and before that he was refinery manager of, of several um, refineries in the US and one in under Castellon Refinery in Spain. Um, he had a lot of experience in operational management, strategy, and corporate roles, and he's going to talk today about Exodum's strategy to adapt to the energy transition. Olga, the floor is yours. All right. Well, hi everyone, and, and thanks very much, Mike, for the introduction. Uh, for first of all, let me thank uh, Stock Expo for inviting inviting me to this event and giving me the opportunity to open this digital conference. Hopefully, next year we'll meet uh, physically and, and not through through the through a screen. So, in, in my brief presentation, what I'll try to do is plant a few seeds of what I think will be the terminal of the future. The tagline of this conference. Um, I don't have all the answers, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to explain what we are thinking of doing or, or preparing ourselves or how we're preparing ourselves for the for the energy transition. And hopefully, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll as I said, I'll just plant a few seeds. We can get in more detail in the panel discussion later on the later on in the afternoon. So uh, first of all, um, you know, let me introduce Exolum. Uh, which is really a new brand for in the industry. Um, so who are we? Um, we are the same company as Mike said, uh, formerly known as CLH with a, with a new name. Uh, the truth though is that CLH has evolved quite a bit in the last few years. The company has 94 years uh, of uh, history, but it was only six years ago when we started to diversify away from Spain, both uh, geographically and in, in terms of the services we, we provide. Uh, we're now present in eight countries, and our most recent milestone was the acquisition of Interterminals in, in Northwest Europe, with which uh, we, we acquired 50 new terminals. Uh, so with that, um, I think we are now uh, European leaders in terms of, um, of storage capacity and pipeline mileage, but more importantly, we aim to be leaders in, in creating value for, for our stakeholders, uh, being our customers, our, our primary ones. So, so you can see here in the in the screen, you know, roughly uh, 68 terminals now, uh, most most of them in, most of them in Europe, and you know, 6,000 kilometers of pipelines, which uh, for a European scale is is pretty big. So, when we um, when we purchased uh, interterminals back last November, we we had as part of a deal to change the interterminals brand into into a new one. Um, the obvious one was CLH, but we thought, uh, you know, was the we took the opportunity to actually kind of open a new chapter in the history of the company and and create one new a new brand, a more modern brand uh, that is going to be you know the single one that we operate with um, under which we're going to be operating in the whole you know globally in the whole uh, world, and it kind of symbolizes our commitment to evolve and grow with the sustainable energy, energy transition beyond the, the traditional hydrocarbon uh, oil business. So the change is both, uh, is important both internally as externally, as we, we wanted to also break some internal inertia uh, as we try to reinvent the company uh, with the energy transition. So that's, I guess, excellent. That's, uh, you know, our new brand, as I said. And, and now let me, let me talk about, you know, the, the you know, the, the topic of the conference, the terminal of the future, I wanted to split the conversation in, in two parts. Um, one is uh, what are we going to be doing going forward and, and a second one is how are we going to do it. And I would like to start with the how first. Um, so 
how we get how we want to operate you know, going forward. Um, in the last few years, I think all of us, all, all you know, every company in pretty much in the world uh, is experiencing an increasing demand from all stakeholders to comply with uh, tighter ESG standards, demanding higher higher levels of compliance and conducting our operations in a more sustainable way. And, and I believe actually COVID has um, a, you know accelerated this trend. Our industry, uh, generally speaking, is pretty old school, I would say, and, and I believe there are some adjustments we, we all need to make. Um, I think for many years we focused a lot on safety, and you know we all, I think, pretty much every company, uh, we keep saying safety, safety first, and I think it's the right thing to do. We've made a lot of improvements on that front, but I think there's a lot more under the ESG agenda. So, um, so firstly, I mean, what are we doing in Exelum? Uh, firstly, we, we were committed to reducing our environmental impact. And three years ago, we pledged to reduce our CO2 emissions by 50% by year uh, 2025. And, and so reducing half our emissions. Our most, I mean, the biggest source of emissions in our company is are the ones generated by the uh, power that we consume. Particularly, we you know in our pump stations uh, that you know that we use for the for the pipeline network, that's pretty much 40, 50 percent of our CO2 emissions. And you know, three years ago, we decided we need to go greener, and we are now building solar panels at our facilities to generate our own power. Uh, so that's one way to to reduce emissions. Another example of this is uh, we're using artificial intelligence to optimize how we manage the, the, the energy consumption throughout our network and, and trying to minimize that. So that's just two examples. Uh, there, there are some others, and we can expand that later on in the, during the panel discussion. But CO2 emissions is obviously uh, big in our agenda now. Uh, not only that, I mean, in terms of environmental um, impact, we're trying to minimize, minimize water usage. That's probably more relevant for Southern Europe where, where we don't get a, a lot of rain. Uh, but you know, that's, uh, we have a few initiatives uh, you know, on this front. Uh, one that I'd mention is we, you know, trying to use the, the little rain that we get, use it for our uh, you know, emergency drills, our firefighting drills. We using that water that we capture from, you know, from when it rains. Um, uh, as I said, trying to minimize the, the, the use of water. In relation with safety, I think you know I'll, I, there's not a ton new. I mean, we just need to keep improving on you know on the on the track record we've built over the years. Uh, I'll, a lot more focus on cybersecurity, and and I would say from my point of view, uh, if we go back to nor the normal safety that we used to, personal process safety, I might be you know concerned with the knowledge transfer as we bring in a lot more younger people that are. They don't have the experience in the industry, and with all the automation, uh, many times I perceive they don't have the risk awareness that uh, you know the old people uh, do. So there's a lot of a lot we're doing in terms of knowledge transfer to make sure that uh, you know the new generation of employees really really will understand the risks and and, and the controls that uh, we need to put in place to 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 make sure that we don't have an incident. Um, then there's another thing I wanted to talk about in terms of ESG, which is the um, the you know the more soft soft skills of how we operate in terms of DNI. Uh, again, uh, our industry is, is male dominated. Traditionally, uh, we have male people in, in the top jobs, and I think we need to make a lot more space for gender diversity to start with. Um, so don't give up on 50% of the talent pool. And in, important at Exelum that uh, we give women the same opportunities that we provide to men, the same positions uh, with the same responsibility. And I'm referring particularly to technical and operational uh, jobs that enable these women later on to aspire to the top jobs. Uh, traditionally, we've had women in other areas of the company, uh, human resources, financial services, etc. Not so much on technical and operations, and I think that's uh, something we're trying to promote at the company. Um, not only that, you know, from a soft skills perspective, we're working on, on on new ways of working, trying to copy from other industries uh, new ways of doing things. Agile methodologies, uh, as an example, uh, to help us innovate and evolve faster and and, and better. Uh, not only, I mean, we've applied that to digital initiatives and not trying to expand that to also to our traditional business, this way of developing projects in a, in a, in a 
more agile and faster way. And finally, uh, you know, as always, we need to work on creating a stronger connections with the communities where, where we operate. And in turn, I'm hoping that a strength that will strengthen our relationship with our employees and customers that will feel more engaged as the company does more for the for the communities. So I know there's you know there's a lot on you know under this ESG agenda. Um, we at Excellent we've uh, adopted the the SDG Sustainable Development Goals from the European uh, sorry so from the United Nations just to help us you know guide us through this journey. And and one thing that worked pretty well for us uh, three years ago is we adopted one of these ESG frameworks uh, that are out there. We're using Resb, but there are many others. So I encourage you know if you haven't done it already, I encourage you to to use one of those to help you improve. Um, the same way in the 90s, we all you know adopted ISO certifications. I think there is a drive now to 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 improve on these on these other things. And, and you know this framework, as I said, is, is has been helpful for us. And now we have pretty clear and specific goals to improve on the on how we conduct our business. That as I said before, I think there's there's still a lot more work to do. That uh, you know the society now is 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 requesting or asking us to to deliver on. So that's you know the kind of the first part of my 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 speech my presentation is how we want to conduct our business going forward in terms of what we're going to do um i guess i would start by saying that uh, the good news for me is that there not everything is about hydrogen or batteries there's still a lot more to do in the you know within the liquid storage business and here i'm pointing i'm pointing out a, a few trends that i see uh, none of them are probably new to you, but I think important to mention that uh, you know there's a lot more demand for 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 more storage and, and for our services. So uh, one of these trends is biofuels, eco fuels. Um, that, that demand keeps growing, getting more sophisticated with the use of new raw materials, blending components, and even new processing units like uh, you know, to produce uh, SAF, sustainable aviation fuel. All of that, at, at the end of the day, requires new tankage, new capacity. So I think there's you know, more business for companies like us. Also, uh, with COVID, we are experiencing some of the companies we deal with, they're, they're aiming for shorter supply chains they don't want to rely on on really far away countries or not completely and that is driving uh you know the help you know will will help will help creating uh you know more local hubs maybe smaller but uh again will require new capacity closer to to home um another trend that i see is a big international oil and petrochemical companies they're focusing more and more their capex programs on, on new businesses on renewables hydrogen etc and with that some of them thinking about contemplating carving out some of their existing infrastructures like tank farms and refineries marine facilities terminals uh and they're you know thinking about selling those to companies like us that will present some opportunities there are several tons that have been done recently, uh, you know, along these these lines, the chemicals and aviation sectors, both of them, uh, their demand keeps growing. Uh, Exelon is particularly interested in the in the aviation business, where we present and we, we handle manage many tank farms and 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 hydrants at many airports. Uh, and you know, after COVID, we still believe that uh, the aviation sector will keep growing the same way as as chemicals. So, you know, opportunities there. And finally, always opportunities to improve our existing business through the use of technology, uh, both driving more efficient and more reliable operations, and also developing new, new applications to better integrate our business with our customers. And, you know, I can give more examples later, but, you know, I think most of you are familiar with, with the use of robots or, or drones for inspecting and cleaning tanks. We're using also satellite pictures and, and treating those uh, with machines to actually uh, do the surveillance of our pipelines that you know before we were doing you know with helicopters or even walking on on top of the pipelines. There are more efficient ways to do that, and with that you know uh, become more efficient. So as always, I think we'll need to be more flexible and adaptable as the world gets more sophisticated. Um, and I think the whole industry is moving along those lines, but. Uh, going back to my previous comment, there's a lot more than hydrogen and batteries. There's a lot to do uh, in our traditional business. 
in terms of new things, I mean, that's part of the job. The other part is preparing ourselves for the future. So what are we doing at Exolum? Um, so we are slowly uh, uh, diversifying away from, as I, as I said before, from the traditional oil business. But we're trying to do that in a prudent way uh, because it's not really clear, at least in my mind, exactly which technology is going to be the one that are, that you know, the, the prevalent technology of the future. Um, we are expanding ourselves in the chemical space. Uh, I know that is not uh, a completely new business, but Exolum or CLH before, where we're not particularly present in that market. With Interterminals, we, we're growing in that space and we want to keep growing. Uh, I think also chemicals will present new opportunities with renewable or, or you know, biochemicals. I don't know what, what, the, what the world is, the new, the, the new word, probably renewable chemicals, but that also will be uh, you know, uh, uh, a growing trend of new raw materials or new treatments that, need, that will need new new tank capacity. Uh, hydrogen is um, is the topic in fashion. I, I guess there's going to be another session later on in the in the conference about hydrogen. Um, from our point of view, it's not economical yet. It's not uh, it's not yet a credible alternative to the traditional fuels. But we believe believe at Exxon that hydrogen will play a part in the in the future energy energy mix in 10 15 years to decarbonize some of the sectors that are difficult to electrify so so we want to play a role in that space in the development of the of the industry and we are already participating in some projects in spain to produce green hydrogen using solar power i personally believe that the most efficient way to to participate is through consortiums that team up governments with with uh, private investors like us I think together we can minimize the risks, uh, invest at scale, you know, bigger projects, and accelerate the technology development that it, that is needed. Um, but but as I said, this is m more planting seeds now for the future. As I don't see it uh, economic uh, economically right now, but we need to do you know start taking some steps in in that direction. Um, Next, uh, circular economy is another unstoppable trend and that is growing uh, and, and we excellent want to play a role in it and we already have a couple of projects in this space. Um, so we're trying to leverage the positions we're in, the, the, the geographies, the locations where we're present and the know-how, doing new things. Uh, and, and in this space, uh, I mean, it's probably going to be uh, new, new products, uh, be it water treatment, or residue treatment. It's also, I mean, we're seeing with uh, with um, biofuels the need for pre-treating new raw materials, and, and we want to be in that in that space. So the, this business, I think, will require um, different uh, different activities to what we're used to. So it's more than the just typical uh, storage and handling that that handling that we've done in the past, but something that our, some of our customers are already inquiring us about, and we're willing to to play in that space and develop new new capabilities. So that's something we, we are also doing. And finally, in terms of new things, we uh, created um, Exxon Ventures, uh, I guess it was 18 year and a half ago. Uh, and this was a, a way to foster innovation within the company. And also we team up with uh, some uh, you know other entrepreneurs or startups that can help us innovate faster and better. Um, so let me give you a couple of examples of things we've done in this year and a half. Uh, we recently launched Avicor, it's uh, probably not known outside Spain, is a new digital business that we launched uh, that is built on top of the infrastructures that we have at, the, at, at, at some Spanish airports. So with this digital application, customers and consumers that fly out of Madrid or Barcelona, no matter what flight they, they take, they can, when, when they book, when they book the flight, when they purchase the ticket through the, you know, an online travel agent like Expedia, Kiwi.com, et cetera, they can choose to put to, when they purchase their ticket to actually fuel that, their, their seat with uh, sustainable aviation fuel. Um, so it's quite an innovative way of, of selling, uh, uh, I guess, the, the green credentials. The, the, and we actually, what we do is, once we get that order, we make sure that in that flight, because we're, we are actually supplying, you know, doing the into plane in, in, in Madrid and Barcelona, we, we make sure that, you know, that, that uh, flight has that um, 
stuff, uh, sustainable aviation fuel. So it's um, it's a it's a it's a way to leverage our position in at the airport at our airports and uh, and actually contribute to the to the green agenda as well. Another example of uh, excellent ventures is is um, is another project to build uh, truck parking lots in our terminals when we have spare land, and also you can book that those you know those parkings uh, through a, a phone app. So again, it's just merging our traditional infrastructure with new new digital applications. These two examples probably was, they're not going to change our PNL dramatically, but I think they're helping us in you know becoming more entrepreneur and and just helping us also uh, get involved with other companies outside that are you know have a different skill set and, and can help us in that transition to to the to the future. Uh, so. As you can see, um, the the you know we're thinking beyond the traditional hydrocarbons, the oil business, but in a prudent way. As I said before, uh, we are going to be doing the you know traditional uh, bulk liquid, liquid storage and and you know are moving stuff through our pipelines for a long for 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 many years to come. So just to finish off as as way of summary, I would say that uh, the terminal of the future I think will be operated in a more sustainable way. The how is going to be different from you know, based, you know, along the lines of what I, I I mentioned before, and it will probably be a lot more than just tanks. Uh, handling and store and storing liquids will remain our key activity for many years to come, but progressively we'll be evolving beyond this. And in any case, well, I believe that uh, we have many more successful years um, ahead of us. So that was that's it. Uh, thank you, thank you for again for for giving me the opportunity to present uh, you know excellence view of the terminal of the future. Okay, thank you, Jorge. Um, so we have about five minutes before the next speaker. Um, I was very interested to hear uh, about the the aviation uh, the. You know, the sustainable aviation fuel. Out of, I don't know whether you would want to answer this, but uh, <laughs> uh, I'm just out of interest. You know, how much, how much more do, do people have to pay to use the, the sustainable jet fuel at the moment? I mean, I know it will come down. It will be, is it? But there must be at the moment there must be some sort of uh, uh, increase in prices to use the sustainable aviation fuel. Oh, can you give us some idea? Is it like 10 percent more or? Well, actually, I mean, okay. <laughs> We we are an infrastructure company and we don't buy or sell the product. In in the case of Avicor, what we do is sell the green certification. Uh, but we are involved in prices. So trying to answer your question, it is a lot more expensive at the moment because there is a there is not a, enough supply and 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 you know as demand keeps growing uh, at the moment it's still very expensive. Uh, so it's about uh, two three times depending. The, the normal price. Uh, so this is a lot more expensive. But for instance, what you know, this Avicor platform that I, I was talking about, um, you know, the product is not ours. It's, it's really the oil companies that sell the product. What we provide is the the end consumer the ability to pay that extra to make sure that uh, you know his part of the ticket, his or her part of the ticket is green. And and for instance, for um, you know, um, for a Madrid London flight. If you pay 25 euros, you can make sure that uh, you know you cut your emissions by 50 percent. Is what I what I'd say. Just order of magnitude. Thank you very much. Now I'm just looking to see uh, what uh, questions we still have. A couple minutes more. We have a question here from Mr. A. Uh, I assume it's Mr. Maybe it's not. It's uh, someone called a H. M. Kong who says good morning and thanks for the presentation. Uh, but existing tanks of fossil fuel products to shift to clean energy storage, are the storage assets easily reusable or reconfigured? Are the capex required for that maybe too big and maybe better to build a greenfield terminal? Thanks. Yeah, well, probably not build a greenfield terminal because the, the you know terminal is a lot more than just tanks. Uh, just all the facilities, the common facilities you need to actually connections, pipelines, etc., GTs. Uh, you still want to keep those. Uh, so the, the answer, I don't think it's a straight a black or white answer. I think it really depends. So some of the big, big tanks that we, you know, like crude tanks, they're going to be very difficult to repurpose. So most likely you'll have to 
is you know remove those scrap those and build newer tanks for for the new raw materials that normally and you know our experience is the industry is requiring smaller tanks and maybe with different different specifications or different metallurgy or you need uh you know heating heated tanks or, or if it, in the case of chemicals each chemical component needs uh you know it, it, it comes with its own specificity so i think there's not a straight black or white answer but i mean i think we will repurpose a lot of the gasol gasoline gasoil tanks those can be repurposed for for other for new products but most likely we'll have to build new tanks in our existing facilities Thank you, Jorge. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with that. Uh, I'd just say there's a bit of a mismatch between what's likely to be required in the future. I totally agree with you that this bulk liquid is still going to be a, a major uh, influence for everybody. Uh, but, uh, you know, maybe the 10 to 20,000 cube tanks are going to be much more useful than the 60 to 100,000 cube tanks, so, or the crude tanks, as you talked about. So, okay, thanks very much. Uh, Maybe one more question with a short one from Palak Mehta. Uh, any plan to set up an LPG LNG terminal? Okay. Um, we're, not, we're not planning on that okay. at the moment, yeah. Okay, um, I think that's it for the moment. Uh, uh, yeah, a little bit more on um, Carlos Copita asked for, uh, what do you mean by infra carve outs? But I think you sort of explained that, didn't you? But maybe you could just re, re uh, yeah, I mean, but just a very, I mean, some oil companies, uh, I won't name any, but uh, there have been uh, some deals already been done. And some of, you know, companies like us, competitors of, of, of Exelum have already uh, entered some of these deals. That A deal by which, you know, a refining company decides to sell, for instance, the tank farm and the jetties to a company like us, infrastructure company. So we operate you know, we operate it and we lease it back to the to the oil company. With that, they get a ton of cash. They can deploy into renewables or whatever they want to do. Uh, and and we we have a long term com a commitment with the refinery such that we operate and maintain the that that those facilities. Okay, Jorge, thank you very much. Well, I think that's it. I will go to the next presentation. Thank you all.